Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our still going bi weekly national calls. Uh, Scott Gam and I are going to continue doing these pretty much every two weeks, as we have been for, um, you know, since March of 2020. I think there's been a couple weeks where it got a little off of the schedule. The only difference is that we're just going to uh, sit here and record it and then make it available um, it, right away on YouTube, on, on video. We'll distribute through DC Today, put it out as the Divinity Cafe podcast, everything we've always done, but rather than um, also tie that to the simultaneous live broadcast, we figured it's easier. We're just seeing that the traffic for this has grown a great deal. There are a lot of people listening to the podcast, watching the video, but the amount of people that are actually trying to make it a point to go capture it live right when it's on, that number seemed less relevant at this, at, at this point in time. Um, should we get to a point where there's an ad hoc event in markets, I'm hopeful Scott would accommodate with his schedule. If we need to jump on live, you know, for a kind of particular event, but having people, meaning all of you, possess the, the flexibility as to when you watch and listen, we thought would be easier for your schedules and probably easier for mine and Scott's and our production team and so forth. So we think the actual literal live footage kind of outlived its usefulness, but nevertheless, the, the content we want to keep going. And so uh, we're still taking questions every single week that we'll cover on this uh, dialogue, uh, questions at thebonsongroup.com, and we'll still continue getting it out at DC Today, on our YouTube channel, on our podcast. Um, I have not conferred with Scott at all about what questions he has on the docket for me today. I do know a lot of things going on in the world right now. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Scott and let him grill me for the next 30 minutes. All right, David. Well, thank you so much, and great to be with you as always. And David, let's start with the markets, as we always do. But broader markets at or near record highs, even with you know, the continual wall of worry that the stock market faces, inflation perhaps being most front and center. Uh, why, why do you think the market is still climbing higher, even with something like that in the backdrop? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to let the premise of the question help answer the question. Um, with a backdrop of big inflation concerns, why are neither the stock or bond markets really responding? And I think that might help to kind of uh, perhaps influence how we interpret what is happening in the economic data. Um, now, first of all, some might interrupt and go, what do you mean the bond market's not responding? The the 10 year yield it moved, it was at you know, 1.35 and now it's 1.55 or something. So you know, the 10 year yield has moved up a tiny bit, but we have to look at this the full year. When did the price data start going higher? When did we start seeing signs of rising prices that began the debate as to whether or not it was transitory, whether or not it was inflationary, whether or not QE was causing it? Well, that was back in March of this year. So let's say about eight months ago, the 10 year then got up to 1.85%. So the fact of the matter is the 10 years is a little higher in the last two weeks, but it's quite a bit lower in the last eight months throughout this whole debate. So I think the bond market has had its opinion all along. And then there are those who say, well, yeah, but maybe the Fed has been buying these bonds through the quantitative easing program, and that's influenced it. The Fed announced that they're tapering away their own purchases of the bonds, and yields came down. They didn't go higher. Uh, which was something I had been writing all year, I expected would be the case because I haven't believed for quite some time that the um, Fed was the reason that the long bond rates were so low. So the broader issue though, that I think is more relevant to people listening that you get at is why is the market not responding much to it? And I don't think we have much of a choice, but to say that the market believes, the market could be wrong. This could all change later. Markets are not, fixed in stone what happened in the past is not predictive of what may happen into the future. But at this juncture in time, markets are speculating, projecting, and pricing that they believe the factors creating these price escalations are, of, uh, are solvable. 
that they are, as I wrote in Dividend Cafe Friday, supply related, meaning we have various extraneous circumstances that are limiting the goods and services and the production of goods and services in the economy and that are serving um, as a hindrance to meeting the delta between the demand and the supply. And that delta is caught with a higher demand than supply is naturally pushing prices higher, um, where I think the markets would revolt as if they believe the uh, price inflationary pressures to be monetary. And um, I do not believe them to be, and the market does not believe them to be, but I do believe there's a very serious supply side problem. And I think that we've talked ad nauseum about the, the supply chain problems, but that's not the only thing I'm referring to here. I'm referring to the fact that people all over the globe massively misestimated, underestimated to be more precise, the um, uh, demand resurgence that would come in a post COVID scenario. And so now that demand has been so escalated, it comes at the same time that you have not only supply chain disruptions, but also total supply production problems, not just getting them off the ports, but actually getting the goods and services made um, for a whole variety of circumstances. And one of them being the one that concerns me the most, uh, which is the decline of labor participation. You need more workers for more supply. You need more productivity for more supply. And with more supply, you'll get price alleviation. I do think it'll happen. The market seems to be saying the same thing. Uh, and David, also we have uh, you know more infrastructure spending coming with uh, the bill expected to be signed today. Um, is that more of a long-term inflationary force or do you not see much of an impact on inflation from that? I don't see much of an impact on inflation from it. Um, neither, of course, do bond yields, um, but I don't see much of an impact into productivity either. I want to be proven wrong there, by the way. I don't want the really minimal effect into productivity from the stimulus bill of 2009 to um, poison the well here. In theory, money can be allocated in such a way that it could marginally have an impact. Um, however, a lot of this money is, doesn't even start uh, beginning to be spent until 2024, 2025, and it lasts over um, a five to 10 year period. So there's a big price tag with the bill, but the actual impact of what things are spent on, where there may be some production, um, is kind of more drawn out. So I don't think there's a huge impact there. Um, and David, when it comes to the, the broader markets, um, you know, the Dow, you know, nicely above 36,000, the S&P not too far from 4,700. Um, any reaction to those particular levels? Um, we mentioned earlier that those are at or near record highs, but um, just because- Yeah, this my, timing, my yeah. position on this is really um, quite consistent that I don't care much about price levels. I care about valuation levels. Um, my friend Kevin Hazitt, who was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House, is a well-known economist for, for many, many years and someone that I, I become friendly with um, through my uh, work with National Review, um, was kind of well-known for the fact that he and a co-author wrote a book predicting a Dow 36,000, and he wrote it a long, long time ago. And so there's sort of this like interesting thing about that number 36,000 because a book had been written predicting that price, you know, at a time when that price seemed, you know, just like fantasy land. But um, uh, as I think we've gone over quite a bit, the market's all time high has been hit hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of times over the last 10 years. And there's nothing about an all time high that has anything to do with what the next price will be because every number on a, a vertically escalating price system is, is on the way up is at one point always the all-time high. The, the question is whether or not valuations are reasonable. And the answer to that is they're more reasonable than contrasted when contrasted to the very low um, interest rate prevalent in the economy. 
and you get a boost in valuation from that low discount rate, that low short-term um, cost of funds. Uh, you, when you compare equities to bonds, <clears throat> the, the um, equity risk premium is very attractive because the, the uh, yield of those earnings in the S&P compared to a bond yield, it, it becomes more attractive when the interest rate is that low. But there are certainly, by a number of metrics, some aspects of the stock market that are expensive. And I could have said the same thing a year ago, and I'm quite sure I did say it a year ago. Some of those things in the tech side have not done well this year. A lot of them are down big. Some are just sort of flattish, including some of the biggest names in the world. Um, and this is always a surprise to people when they find out, you know, that these numbers have been a little underwhelming in, in more recent times, like this calendar year. Some, though, have done, you know, quite well. Uh, is a day of reckoning coming that's sort of akin to what happened in the NASDAQ in March of 2020? I don't know. I, I don't think uh, it all ends real well, but I don't know that it comes with a big bang moment like happened uh, over 20 years ago. I just know that when you talk about valuations, um, that not all sectors of the marketplace are created equal. And I think in the long term, valuations matter a great deal, but they don't always matter so much in the short term. And we do tend to see some seasonal strength at this time of the year heading into year end, right? Uh, as folks reposition, talk about a Santa Claus rally, that kind of phenomenon. Uh, is that, you know, something you want to weigh in on or is that not even relevant to, you know, maybe the, the discussion of markets today? Yeah, I mean, um, in my 20 plus years of doing this, I sure feel I've all, I think I may have said this line before, I'm open to my wife correcting me. It feels to me like around the holidays, about half the time throughout my marriage and my adult career, that markets have done pretty well. And about half the time, something seems to have gone wrong. Um, so that doesn't seem like a very clear trend one way or the other as to what could happen. But I know that when markets go up a lot in December, we refer to it as a Santa Claus rally. I think the problem is that generally we're talking about like certain um, revenues really escalating at the end of the year, that the market gets final indication that some concerning legislative things don't happen or some good legislative things do happen. And then that kind of just happens to get priced near the end of the year. There are um, event driven particulars in more recent history that are real and, and, and relevant. In uh, 2012, going into 2013, there was this thing that we were calling the fiscal cliff. And it was the concern that a lot of the investment tax rates and personal income tax rates from the George W. Bush administration um, were gonna be resetting back to pre-tax cut levels. And there was a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty in the market. And near the very end of the year, over the holidays, they kind of worked a lot of that out. It got worked out very favorably relative to what markets were concerned about. So you had a big rally. I don't think that was relevant to the fact it happened to be the month of December. If the Bush tax cuts were going to be expiring in July, it would have been summer. But it, my point being, it was event driven. Um, I can assure people who remember December of 2008 that that was not a Santa Claus rally. It was a very difficult time in markets. Um, but there's been plenty of Decembers that were quite strong in markets. Last year was a pretty good one. December 2018, by the way, well before anyone ever used the term COVID, um, the markets in the fourth quarter of 2018 dropped 20%, particularly on Christmas Eve, were down, I think, 700 points um, in 2018. But then you got a, a pretty good rally in the couple of days after Christmas. So my point is, uh, all over history and recent history, there's, there's different periods of different events. I'm not looking to the seasonal nature of November and December to have anything particularly relevant happen to markets. Could there be an event-driven response around something with China, an event-driven response around something with legislation? Um, certainly. But we're pretty much done with earnings season now. And we pretty much know where the Fed is. There, there is no groundbreaking surprise announcements, I expect, from the Fed. 
So all things being equal, I think and I hope it's going to be a boring next six weeks to end 2021. Um, and then I think we enter 2022 with a lot of questions. And believe me, we'll be doing plenty of talking about that, writing about that as we go into the new year. But as far as Santa Claus rally, next four weeks, next six weeks, um, I, I, I think it's a coin flip. And David, uh, we have an extra trading day this year uh, because there's no market holiday around New Year's Day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we are open December 31st, which is a Friday. Yeah, I try, I'm go. trying to think if that's going to be a half day or not. Um, I, I believe Christmas Eve is going to be a half day of trading and New Year's Eve will be a full day. But let's just say that for those that are wondering what the New Year's Eve day will be in terms of trading, um, I will tell you where most Wall Street traders are going to be that day. <laughs> and it is not at their desk. <laughs> yes. Um... I think they call those days light volume days. <laughs> Very much so, yes. Um, David, let's also talk about earnings season, which is wrapping up. We've got some retail names reporting this week. We'll get a better sense of the state of the consumer or perhaps more importantly, what these CEOs have to say about supply chain issues as we head into the holiday shopping season. Any thoughts on what we've seen so far from earnings seasons? And then also talk about the retail sector if you could. Yeah, so um, we're not 100% of the way done. Like you said, there's a couple of retailers still reporting. But as far as the, <clears throat> the normalcy of the earnings calendar, it's effectively like 96% of the S&P 500 that's reported. So we're ready to kind of close the books on Q3 with a very close to 17% year-over-year revenue growth in the quarter and 41.5% earnings growth. And those numbers will be in D.C. today today. Um, so the earnings growth that we've gotten from the earnings troughs of a year ago, post COVID and post lockdowns, um, have pretty much mirrored the recovery in markets as you'd expect, and outperformed expectations. Earnings in Q2, Q3 of last year did not contract as much as been feared. They contracted, they contracted a, a fair amount, but it was not as much as people expected. And then the actual earnings growth in Q1, 2, and now 3 has been uh, far above expectations. Um, so that's the reason for markets recovery. And it speaks to the resilience of corporate America. Uh, but the, it also does beg the question as to the sustainability of earnings surprises. And I'm torn on this subject because at some point, you think the market loses the ability to surprise mark companies lose the ability to surprise markets without performance because people throw in the towel and just start overshooting on expectations. And yet, the reason why I'm pulled the other way is um, I, I could say that every quarter, but you're now six quarters in a row of pretty substantial outperformance relative to expectation. And a lot of people felt this was going to be the quarter where markets finally couldn't outperform the way they had been used to doing so, and they did it again. So margins are growing, top line revenues are growing, and uh, this is a big part of the inflation story about that delta between demand and supply. A lot of people underestimated demand in the economy, demand from, from uh, the citizenry, and um, I think a lot of that demand underestimation comes down to a really tremendous misunderstanding of the human person. So, um, what about sort of holiday spending, that kind of scenario, uh, given all the supply chain issues we've been seeing? Uh, is that, uh, you know, an important story for markets? Is that something you think uh, some of the retail CEOs will shed more light on this week when we hear more from them? Most of the stuff that's directly relevant to holiday shopping are in the consumer discretionary space where they kind of live and, and die off of being able to outperform expectations um, seasonally, like holidays or sometimes back to school shopping or different you know, uh, events that are specific to what that, whatever we may be talking about in terms of a brand or category or type of, of discretionary consumer operation. 
we are uh, historically uninvested in the space or very lightly invested um, simply because they often tend to be very overlevered companies and very cyclical and don't often meet the criteria of good consistent dividend payers and, and dividend growers. Um, but of course, the only companies affected by the, re the Christmas shopping season, the holiday shopping period, so to speak, are not just the retailers and consumer discretion names, because you do have um, other aspects of the economy that are relevant. You could argue that some of the um, shopping mall REITs, some of the manufacturers, uh, the consumer staples might be, um, you know, the industrials might be indirectly uh, impacted. But I am so consistently supply side here that basically the things that benefit the consumer discretionary space are always, in my opinion, the um, aftermath or the conclusion or the result of the things that really matter, meaning the production oriented solutions in the economy. So I take for granted that when credit's not heavily constricted, which I assure everybody it is not, and the production side of the economy is rolling, that the consumption side follows. I don't, I don't believe we struggle in our country from an ability to get people to consume when they want to. Everyone seems to be pretty good at doing that. And I think that applies to retail and and Christmas and holiday shopping experiences and discretionary levels of dollars spent as well. So I don't want to say it doesn't matter. Um, it, it matters very little, I think, in our portfolio, to be candid. But I think it matters to people who have more of a retail oriented and consumer discretionary oriented portfolio. And David, let's end with a topic on ta uh, taxes because. For a good part of this year, we spent a lot of time talking about worries about higher tax rates, capital gains tax rates, corporate tax rates. Some of those worries seems, seem to have subsided in recent weeks and months. Um, we'd love to get your updated view on what you're hearing on the tax front and, and how worried investors should be about the possibility of higher taxes in 2022. Well, it would appear that the White House's own version that um, still has to get scored and then worked out by um, the CBO and then, and then presumably passed by the House Democrats and then go back to the Senate for more adjustment and assuming it gets passed, resent back to the House. And based on what the Senate adjusts, the House then has to re-vote based on whether or not they approve of what the Senate did that in this whole chain of events that still lies ahead, that there isn't even going to be a uh, increase in marginal income tax rates on business income, on investment income, or on personal income. Now, even if there were, I don't know that this process of this bill becoming law is going to happen. I do. I said before that I thought if an infrastructure bill didn't pass, there's no way reconciliation would and vice versa, that if an infrastructure bill did pass, the reconciliation would. I still think that's the best bet, but there are some, there, the, the, the reconciliation bill can't pass without somebody caving. And it now looks like someone will, will cave and it looks like that will be the progressives, um, that they will have to agree to a lot of things they said they weren't gonna agree to, namely not raising taxes, Tons of the kind of green and climate oriented things have been taken out. And then the spending levels, although they are quite high, um, are not what they had insisted and demanded that they wanted. So I do think that uh, it looks like part of the way they're telling the computers that, that they're going to raise revenue from this bill is a surtax on income over. Um, 10 million a year, an extra like 8% tax there. And I think it's a 3% tax uh, at, at other levels. I mean, there's a little escalating surtaxes at, at very, very high levels of income. So um, a couple of those things may happen, but, uh, and, and, and I'm not really happy about it, but I don't, I don't know if it's gonna pass. And I don't think it's obviously market impacting. So the question then is, well, what, are, what is market impacting from the legislation? Um, if the tax rates aren't moving a lot, does the market mind 
that they are spending what could end up being one and a half to two trillion dollars more. And I don't think that the equity markets see it as a huge event. I think the macro economy, if I'm right, that um, further deficit spending uh, extracts from future economic growth. I think that this does speak to how we want to be positioned for the future. And the way I want to be positioned for the future is um, outside of this narrative of heavy dependence on fiscal and monetary stimulus. And I believe that, that the policy indicators are such that they want to double down on dependence you know, on, on both the fiscal and monetary side. So we have a, a portfolio view that's very con contrary there. We want to be much more organically minded around free cash flow growth, around fundamentals, and around balance sheet strength. And I, I'm not pessimistic overall about uh, the state of the market, but I am very much intensifying in my belief that selectivity is more important, uh, both with the equity side and the alternative side. Fixed income, not as much on your boring bonds. That those are just parking lots, and you're just buying. You know, you could set your blended duration at three or at six. It really, it makes a few basis points of difference. Um, but on the equity side and the alternative side, I think selectivity is becoming increasingly important. Uh, and and David, this idea though that, um, and, and we didn't. This is not your view, but that that folks should be making portfolio moves in anticipation of some sort of tax increase. Uh, reiterate your views on that, because there, there was a lot of talk about that over the past couple of months. Yeah, I don't think people should be making estate planning moves, tax planning moves, or in portfolio moves until they have clarity on what the bill is. All move, Because there's no free lunch, which is the name of a book I recently wrote, meaning everything in economics is about trade-offs. It isn't like one could say, okay, well, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I'm going to do X to mitigate against the risk of something happening and have X be cost-free. There's some cost associated with X. There's some trade-off. Otherwise, one would have already done X. They haven't done X because there's a cost to it. And, and it maybe helps with the risk of one thing, but it adds to the risk of another or what have you. And because it appears that so much of the legislative ambition um, that was behind a lot of this reconciliation bill has been defeated, uh, I don't believe people help themselves to incur unnecessary costs in the trade-offs of this non-free lunch that is planning for a reconciliation bill that requires um, passage in a very divided Congress, a very divided Senate, and therefore, uh, I think people are wise to wait to see what's going to be in the bill versus trying to get out in front of it. And the only thing I want to add to that comment um, versus similar sentiments I've shared in the past about trying to get into capital gain management and incurring capital gain taxation based on a belief about what might happen in the future, and, and I'm vehemently opposed to such a thing based on the legislative uncertainty around all this, and at this point, the legislative likelihood of that not happening. But I would apply that same principle to one's estate planning as well. People can talk with their advisors about different ideas, be prepared for what may or may not be out there. But those that are writing as if these things are fait accompli, they are wrong. And uh, many of the things that people were months ago believing to be very likely are now not even on the table, Scott. Yeah, well said. Um, David, uh, I think that's a, a good place to leave our conversation for now, um, but I'll, I'll toss back to you for any closing thoughts. Thank you, as always, Scott, for the time. I hope you guys have all gotten something out of it. The big three right now, the inflation, the reconciliation bill, and then, um, and then uh, earnings you know, are the three things we primarily talked about today. But there's going to be a lot to focus on, drill down deeper into in the weeks and months ahead around energy, around um, commodity prices, around economic growth assumptions. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be complacent about anything right now, but you, you know what we're doing. We're going to keep doing it. I'll go ahead and leave it there and uh, hope that this has been a beneficial time. We welcome any of your feedback and comment, and we certainly welcome your questions. To, the quest, uh, to questions at thebonsongroup.com. 
Thank you for joining me and Scott here on our national conversation.